Mr. Robert Taylor, who is a member of the Automobile tell, wait a minute, Society for Automotive Historians. He's going to talk us to us about Frank Snell, automobile pioneer from Waterville. Give him a hand. Thank you, everyone. It's so nice to be here today. Um, before we get into talking about Frank, I want to talk a little bit about the area in the mid to late 1800s that led to Frank being able to build his automobile. With the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825 and its subsequent enlarging in the decades that followed, it brought great growth to upstate New York and New York City actually too. Prior to that, farmers had to depend on ox teams to try and get their goods to market. So they had a limited area that they could actually sell goods. Uh, fresh fruit and vegetable doesn't travel well, especially when it's traveling that slowly. So with the, with the opening of the Erie Canal and then later the birth of the railroads, um, it meant that goods that would have taken months to get to the economic centers in, in Eastern United States, could now travel there in a period of weeks. And that meant that all of a sudden the farmers had an expanded market. And another thing that benefited them was with the canal and the railroads, the cost of shipping went down dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so by the late 1800s, it was about a 10th of what it had cost them to ship goods before. So now you had farmers that had actually had some disposable income. And mm -hmm along with the opening of the canal, which was a tremendous undertaking that was known throughout the world, it brought a lot of tourism and it brought a lot of engineers because the engineers were wanting to understand how they could build this magnificent canal with all its locks in such a quote unquote backward country compared to what they viewed. So the engineers would get together and they would talk. And they would talk about the Erie Canal, but they would also talk about what was going on in Europe and England and, and the British Empire. And one of the things that was very hot in, in those areas was the horseless carriage or the automobile. So I'm sure that Frank Snell was involved in many of those conversations. Um, he probably didn't dream though that his activity would have such an impact on the world that we live in. So we're gonna give you a little background on Frank Snell. He was born in June, 1851 on a farm that was established by his grandfather, Josiah Snell. Josiah had moved to the Sanger Field area after the war of 1812. Later, his parents ran the farm and they raised four boys and two daughters there. Frank became a blacksmith in the village of Waterville, and he died on March 20, 15, 1927, aged 74 years old. At the time of his death, he was a trustee of the village of Waterville. And on October 25th, they had an auction of his personal property. There were two automobiles, numerous tools for the blacksmith and carpentry trades. And so you think about it, 1851, 1927. What do we see on the tombstones? We see that little dash in between. And in so many cases, that is all we know about people's lives. And yet that dash encompasses all those decades that they did things. Fortunately, Frank left a legacy that has given us so much information about that dash. There's a, still a lot that we don't know, probably a lot that we never will know about, about all the things that he did during his lifetime, but he's, his activities sparked the imagination of many people. And I'm so glad to see so many of you here today to enjoy this information. So what did Frank do that was so special? Well, the theme I have is Frank Snell, the man, the machine, the mystery. So we talked a little bit about Frank. Now we're going to go to the machine. So some 20 years prior to his death, around the year 1900, Frank was in his uh, late 40s. 
He had what's probably a thriving blacksmith business. Waterville had become the seat of the hops capital of the world, I guess they called it. And there was a lot of different things that were going on. And the blacksmiths played a very important role in the life of a community. Along with shoeing horses, they kept the buggies working. And without them, they wouldn't be, people wouldn't be able to transport things. So at the same time in the late 1800s, there were a couple of magazines that came out that were focusing on a new method of locomotion. One published in 1895 in England was called the auto car. And the same year here in the United States, the magazine Horseless Age was published. And that magazine still exists under a different name today. So you have these engineers coming from Europe and, and England, sharing ideas. You have these magazines and a lot of people, common ordinary people like you and I decided, I wanna build a car. Some were successful, many weren't. And, and yet they were living in a time when most people had never heard of a horseless carriage or an automobile. In fact, in 1899, there were 30 different manufacturers here in the United States producing automobiles. And they produced a total of 2,500 cars that year. That worked out to, if we go by the 1900 census, census rather, um, one vehicle for every 30,000 people living here in the United States. So when I say that most people had never heard of an automobile or seen one, you know what I'm talking about. And of this 2,500 cars, there was one manufacturer and it wasn't Henry Ford, his day in the sun would come a few decades, a few years later. This one manufacturer, which was a local wheel company, produced some 40% of these vehicles. And the vehicle they produced wasn't even an internal combustion engine. It was, it was actually a steam car that had been developed by the Stanley Brothers of Newton, Massachusetts. So you have very few cars. You have another problem if you're at one of the fortunate 2,500 owners of cars in 1900, where do you get it fixed? There were no uh, auto repair shops. There was no, uh, nothing. There wasn't an auto zone or, or Napa. Um, so in fact, the first automobile repair shop in the United States opened in Boston in 1899. And it was out of business by 1900. So if you had a vehicle and it broke down, you had two choices. You could ship it back to the manufacturer if they were still around and wait for who knows how long to get it back. Or you could go to your local blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith, he was used to working on very similar vehicles to what you had. The only difference was this had an engine where the vehicles he worked on had a horse in front. And so the blacksmith would be able to repair the part. If he couldn't repair it, maybe he found something apart from the carriage trade that he could modify. And if he was an especially skilled craftsman, he would actually be able to make the part from scratch. And so, it made a huge difference for people to be able to have a vehicle and run it because they didn't have auto parts stores. The first auto parts store was Western Auto Store that opened in 1909 in Kansas City, Missouri. And it was mail order. So again, you know, you'd have to wait for your part to come. It wasn't until 1921 they actually opened a physical location for people to go in. So we don't know a lot about Frank Snell's interest in the horseless carriage or automobile as we call it today. But we do know that in 1900, he developed and drove in, in Waterville, New York, a very incredible vehicle. It was a vehicle that was really ahead of its time here in the United States. The first Cadillac of 1902 was powered by a single cylinder engine. 
I just read an article on a person that just did a drive in in 1906. He said it was tremendous, almost death defying charge to, to start the car. They had the crank on the side because if you weren't careful, it would run you over if you were cranking it from the front. And he said that the thing vibrated so bad it would shake your dentures out. So here Cadillac in 1902 had a single cylinder engine. The curved dash Oldsmobile, which was the first success of, successful Oldsmobile and also the first car that had a semblance of mass production was a 1901 vehicle with again, a single cylinder engine. And then along came Frank Snell. He had a twin cylinder opposed piston vehicle. Basically it was a four cylinder power plant. It had two cylinders and the piston would meet in the middle fire and then they'd go back out. Uh, I've got some pictures here and I also have a lot of information there you can look at after. You would think that this would have been a marvel of the age that would have been you know, proclaimed from the rooftops, but instead it languished in a barn of a relative of his from some time after he built it till 1937. And then in 1937, I don't know whether this farmer needed more space or was tired of looking at it. He pulled it out and put it by the side of the road with a for sale sign on it. Now, it survived somehow the World War I uh, metal drives. Maybe the fact that it was hidden away in a shed somewhere on the barn sealed its state, spate, its state rather. And maybe it was that Frank couldn't bear to see this car that he had lavished so much time and attention on be destroyed. But whatever reason, here it was now sitting on the side of the road. Was it going to rot away there like so many buggies did at the time? Well, again, there were some circumstances that in intervened. There were two brothers. They were actually from the Boonville area, but they did road work. And they had a contract to do road repairs in the area. And the place that they were lodging at went by this farm. And as they were driving back and forth, they'd see this old buggy sitting there. And they never thought much about it until one day they noticed that it seemed to have something hanging down underneath it. So they stopped and took a look. Um, the owner told them about the history of the car that had been built by Frank. And uh, I'm quite sure that some dickering took place, but when they were done, the owner was a little richer and they now had another automobile. I think about, I wish there was such thing as time travel, because maybe I'd have a Snell. Well, Claude and Vernon were both inventors. In fact, Vernon had some 300 patents here in the United States at the time of his death. In fact, I've got some information on a differential unit that he invented that was used in a number of vehicles. Um, one of them was uh, the tractor or tug, they called it, that was used to pull the airplanes for the Air Force. Uh, another one, another vehicle that used his differential was the Humvee. But also the, we've all heard of the Audi Quattro and, and what a successful vehicle that was. Well, their success came from the fact that they used his differential in their quattros for many years. So quite an accomplishment for a man who didn't have an engineering degree. But they went to give him an award once when they realized that he wasn't a quote unquote engineer, they wouldn't give him to him. <laughs> so I think that Vernon and Frank would have really got along well together had they known each other. They Neither one was an engineer, but they both had a genius that allowed them to accomplish things that others might've thought impossible and wouldn't even given a chance to try. Um, not only was the Snell preserved, but it was returned to Waterville in 1971 for their centennial celebration. And Vernon also did a lot of research on the vehicle and the fact that I'm here today talking to you is partly because of all the research that he did. He did this research not only here in the United States, but also in Europe. And he came to realize something. He came to realize that this vehicle that Frank uh, 
Snell had created Odin's assistance to not just Frank Genius, but also to other gifted men. And that brings us to the mystery part of our discussion today. So we know Frank was a real person. He built an automobile that was reported on with pictures in the Waterville Times of November 9th, 1900. And I don't know if I've got a picture of that, let me see. No. Okay, try this. No, I don't. So, but we will. Yeah. It's on the table here anyway. So, we also know something else. Um, the vehicle still exists today. It's in a museum in Tallahassee, Florida. The only thing is when it went into that museum, it was identified as an early Durea automobile, which isn't so. But now it's properly identified as a Snell. And one of the reasons that it is now given the credit that it deserves is because there was a lady at the Waterville Historical Society, Sue Fry, who had a lot of correspondence back and forth with the museum in Tallahassee. And she helped them to realize that this vehicle had been misidentified. And so here we have a blacksmith from upstate New York whose vehicle is in a museum in Florida and he's getting credit for it today. So I think we owe Sue a, a, a hand for, of appreciation. When he was building this car, there were a lot of young people that of course, you can imagine what it must've been like for kids to see somebody building a car back in late 1800s, around 1900. There were a lot of young people that were interested. And they really believed that he built the whole car. That isn't true. But that doesn't take away from his genius because he worked out of a little garage, which still exists in Waterville. And there's no way he would have had the facilities to make all the complicated parts that went into the building of this automobile. Today, even with many com components readily available, the cost of, of designing and developing an internal, internal combustion engine for manufacture can run into millions of dollars. And I don't think blacksmiths got paid that much back in 1900. So in Frank's case, he would have had to make all these different components in house, making the cost of his engine prohibitive for even the most experienced craftsman. So he would have to assemble it from a variety of components that he obtained. But this doesn't take away from the accomplishment that he did. Far from it, even today, automobiles are assembled from components acquired from various manufacturers. And this was even more so in the early days of the automobile. So you decide, I'm going to start building cars. So you'd get a transmission from one place, an engine from somebody else, steering gear someplace, differential, wheels, tires, um, there's a nice display here on the Willoughby Custom Body Works. They built bodies for various manufacturers. Lincoln was one of the prominent ones. And you would get a body from, from a company like that. A lot of these manufacturers used to build buggies. And so it was a logical step that they would start building bodies for automobiles. In fact, there was one of the, uh, there were a few automobiles that were built right here in Utica. One of the which was the Remington, which was built between 1901 and 1904 here, they purchased their bodies from the Willoughby, Willoughby Owen and Company and wheels and axle from Western Mott. And think about Henry Ford. We all are familiar with 
what he was able to do with his Model T. That was actually the third company that he established. One of the companies that he established that he left later became Cadillac. So he was instrumental in founding probably one of the cheapest, least expensive vehicles available here in the States to one of the most expensive vehicles available here in the States. Well, he assembled a team of engineers, machinists, and draftsmen to design his automobiles. And he was very successful. He built some 17 million of the Model T Ford. And even that Model T Ford, the engine transmission and differential were for many years built for him in the machine shop of John and Horace Dodge. They got into a disagreement with Ford about uh, dividend payments. Henry bought their shares out, moved all his construction of all major components in house. And the Dodge brothers used the money that they'd made from Henry to start Dodge Brothers, company that we still have today. So, and even when Henry was building the Model T almost entirely in house, he was still getting his tires from Firestone. So where did Frank Snell, a blacksmith in a small town in upstate New York, get the components to build his automobile. For over a century, that's been a mystery, but it seems that maybe this mystery is on the verge of being solved. I say it's on the verge because it seems that we almost know for certainty where the main parts of the vehicle came from, how he came by those components is a mystery that may never be solved. So we have this picture of of the Snell automobile from the country editor of June 5th, 1977. There's a brief article that goes along with the picture. It says, the Snell, a one of a kind automobile was built in Waterville, New York by a local mechanic and blacksmith named Frank Snell. One account in a local newspaper indicates that Frank had the car running on April 25th, 1899, but it may be that only the engine was running on that date for an item in the Waterville Times dated November 9th, 1900, noted that the Snell ran the car on November 7th and that it ran nicely, but was rather too fast for everyday use on our roads. The article goes on to say, the Snell is powered by a four cylinder opposed piston engine of very unconventional design. Cylinders are encased in a box shaped water jacket made of heavy sheet copper and the exposed two throw crankshaft is located beneath the cylinders. The car is co-owned by Claude and Vern Gleesman and is at Claude's home in West Leiden, New York. The end of the article. So let's take a look of some of the main components now of this vehicle. The engine is a most complex piece of engineering. It consists of two horizontal cylinders that, as I get said, it, the pistons meet in the center of the cylinder. So there wasn't a cylinder head and a spark would fire and, and cause the cylinders, the piston to go back out. And through a toggle mechanism, they would uh, turn the crankshaft. And so if we look at this next slide, we see uh, chief moving parts of a, two cylinder horizontally um, uh, opposed piston engine rather. And so you look at all those components that would have to be made. It was a complicated process. If you could find a foundry capable of reproducing this engine today it would cost you an awful lot of money. Certainly not the kind of money that as we said, Frank had access to. It also had so many other components that all had to work in harmony. Um, had an ignition system. Um, it was a make and break system where the points, one point was fixed, the other would move. And when it moved, it made a spark, which fired off the, fired off the fuel. It had a two-speed planetary transmission, differential, final chain drive, muffler, uh, 
an early rad rudimentary radiator. If he'd had to make these parts, by, it would have taken him forever to put that car together. In fact, many cars got so far and languished in a barn someplace until they were finally destroyed because the person working on it reached a stumbling block. And there were hundreds of automobile companies that were set up, but that was the fate. They made a, a prototype, couldn't get it to work right, and they went out of business. And all of these had to work in harmony. If the engine's too big, the transmission won't stand the strain. Uh, if the final drive is wrong, something's gonna break. So, and yet when we look at some of these companies like the Remington company here in Utica, they were backed by people who had access to top ranked engineers and financial resources that Frank wouldn't have access to. And if you, I brought a book on uh, American cars. I've got a huge book home on cars of the world. It's 640 very tiny, that's why I use glasses, printed pages on all these different cars that were made throughout the world. And neither of those books, of course, has a Snell in it. So of these companies, very few exist today. Of the hundreds of companies that were here in the US, only Ford, GM, and Chrysler are still doing volume ma manufacturing of internal combustion vehicles. So how was Frank able to build this incredible vehicle? Well, we probably never know for sure, but it may be that he was able to obtain an early automobile that was so badly damaged that even with his skills and craftsmanship, he wasn't able to rebuild it. And it seems that this must have happened and thus it became the donor of the components that went into his vehicle. And it's interesting, uh, Vern, Vernon Gleesman looked high and low to try and find where this vehicle came from. Um, he took the vehicle to the Crawford Auto and Aviation Museum in Cleveland, Ohio, and had it evaluated by the engineers there. And one thing they agreed on, it was not a home-built vehicle. It was built by a company, most likely English. And so he started looking in Europe to find companies that made an engine that fit the description of the engine in the snow. Um, he thought he found it. In fact, uh, in the analysis of this, of this car, it talks about an engine that was made in France called the Edelman. The only trouble with that is that engine wasn't built until after Frank built the snow. Well, I've been spending a little bit too much time visiting doctors in Cooperstown. And one of the treats that Lori and I have is we'll go to thrift stores and check things out. And when I was there, I found the book, the one that's open there. And Lori being a very patient woman allowed me to buy it. I have probably 5,000 different articles, books, magazines, pictures of vehicles but I keep them in my loft area so she doesn't mind too much. Well, when I'm looking through this book, I found a picture of a vehicle called the Harold Johnson dog cart. And this is it right here. And the description said it used a twin cylinder opposed piston engine. So I did some research and managed to find some other articles. And lo and behold, it almost completely matches the engine in Frank Snell's car. The only thing is, according to the books, and we know that the books can be wrong on dates, um, 
their first twin cylinder dog cart wasn't built till 1900. And here Frank is in late 1900 using that engine in his vehicle. So there may be a discrepancy. We don't know how he got the engine. I would, I'm still researching, hoping to find out. Um, but anyway, these, this picture I showed earlier of the various components, that is the components, some of the components of the Errol Johnson dog cart engine. And here's a, a small view of that engine. And, and actually this next picture is kind of neat because it shows how these engines would work. See how the pistons are meeting in the middle and they use linkages to connect to the crankshaft to change that back and forth motion to rotary motion. There were a number of these opposed piston engines that were built in the early 1900s. And actually they're still being used today to power tanks, large ships and things like this. They actually use them in airplanes in the mid 1900s. But uh, they never really did catch on as an engine for most automobile manufacturers, because there's a lot more complexity to them. Um, the Gro, Gro, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, Gabon Brule automobile in France actually used one from the late 1800s to 1922. But their engine was different in that two of the pistons were hooked to the crankshaft and the top two pistons, they had long arms that went up and across and it was very complicated set up. So, but this company that built the Errol Johnson, they were originally in the locomotive trade. So not only did they have the access to the technology to build such an advanced vehicle, but because of their involvement in the locomotive trade, they had the ability to manufacture it. Their first engines were single cylinder, two piston. And then, as I said, around 1900, they went to a twin cylinder uh, power plant. And it looks very similar to the engine in the Snell automobile right there. So when we get back to what Frank built, he had a two-speed plus reverse planetary transmission operated by brake bands like the Errol Johnson. It had a finned copper tube radiator like the Errol Johnson, Ackerman steering, an advanced differential and heavy duty suspension. And like I said, all of these components had to work together for this to be a successful vehicle. The radiator was contoured to fit the underside of the vehicle and actually was the width of the vehicle. And it was made up of, of copper tubes with a lot of fins on them. And the fins were placed, you know, they weren't just haphazard, but they were spaced equally all around these tubes. This is something that really couldn't have been built by trial and error. It would have needed a punch press with special dye to cut out the fins required to dissipate the heat from the operation of the engine. The radiator had to be big enough to efficiently cool the engine, but if it cooled it too much, the engine wouldn't run. If it didn't cool it enough, the engine would get hot and seize up, which happened with many early engines. And then you get to the transmission again, it had to be the right size. If it was too heavy, it wouldn't have been practical. If it was too light, it wouldn't have stood up. And he made a car that was capable of a tremendous turn of speed. It was so fast that it was unsafe on the roads at the time, especially with the tires that they, he had, solid rubber tires. So he made an engine governor. And the governor he used was a flyball governor from a steam engine. And it's interesting in his evaluation of this, uh, Vernon Gleesman brought out that it would have taken a tremendous mathematician to get this working right so that the engine would run at all, 
and and still be efficient. So he he governed it down to about 25 miles an hour. When we realized that Henry Ford's first vehicle with the quadricycle from 1896 um, had a two-speed transmission like the Snell, top gear might get 20 miles an hour. So you take a man with who was in engineering with engineer friends, and then you take Frank Snell. And, and so you can see just how amazing an accomplishment his Frank's vehicle was. So even if you had all the components, would you be able to assemble the vehicle? And maybe you would, but it might not actually do the job you wanted it to. Um, actually, Henry Ford's quadricycle had no brakes. An ancestor of mine, back in the mid 1800s in Canada, he built a steam powered vehicle. It ran really good, but he neglected to put brakes on it. And it was pretty good downhill run to his, to his house. Um, so it didn't stop too well. The car was quickly relegated to the lot of his carriage shed and he installed the engine and boiler in his boat, which was a much safer means of travel for him. Interesting, that car also survives to this day. During World War II, they came around doing a scrap drive and they looked up at it in the loft of the carriage shed and it was figured it was more trouble than it was worth to drag it out of its resting place. So today, this vehicle that Frank Snell built in Waterville, New York, has a place of honor in the Tallahassee Automobile Museum, having again been properly identified as the creation of Frank Snell. And on the table, you'll see a picture of Frank Snell and a Mrs. Brainerd of Waterville riding in this car. She must have been a very brave woman to be in a vehicle that could go so fast on those little skinny hard rubber tires. And it, interestingly, those tires are marked Goodyear. I think it was 1899. And when the company was contacted, they said that was those tires were made just six months after the company was founded. So I guess they were making good tires back then. Mm -hmm. So the vehicle that Frank used to put all this into was, was what was called a Democrat wagon. And it was the type of wagon that you would use to take the family to church on Sunday. And then through the rest of the week, you'd take the back seat out and you'd use it for general chores, picking up feed and supplies. You might say it was the pickup truck of 1900. And so here, Frank, we don't know why he didn't use the tires that would have come with, with the Errol Johnson dog cart if that was what he actually used. But there was some reason why those weren't available. So here you have this vehicle running on these big hard rubber tires, probably quite similar to the penny farthing bicycle there in the background. I would imagine that 25 miles an hour in that vehicle on the roads of the time must have felt like flying. I know the horses didn't like it, so that Mrs. Brainerd must have been a very brave woman to even get in the vehicle with them. But I do know that Frank would have been pleased to know that the vehicle that he built over 120 years ago still exists and is generating interest both in his hometown, but also in other parts of the US. I could go into great detail on other technical aspects of the vehicle, but I think I've talked enough already. But Laurie and I would like to thank you for your kindness in, in joining us today and hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you have any questions, I'll try and answer them. Also, if you get a chance to go to the Waterville Historical Society, they have a very nice model of the Snell automobile that's on display there. It was built by a talented, but very publicity shy local Waterville resident. And so they've got a lot of nice things to see.
and I'm sure that they'd enjoy having you visit them once the museum opens again. Thank you for coming and. Thank you.